your duty is to extend your office or extend your motto to others to teach and preach others likewise if you are doing violence and if you are not doing violence as well as instigating provoking or challenging or leading the people in such a way that they will be provoked to violence that is also offensive so there are four other modes of violence what is delegative violence in which you lead others so that in your leadership or under your speech and direction they are going for this violence that is known as delegative and the second thing is responsible a government a ruler an administrator whether they are indulging in violence or not wherever violence happens within the area of administration or jurisdiction they are responsible for that so people not doing violence but still under the leadership if anybody commits violence they are also partner of it number 2 in the jurisdiction and administrative ambit if something is done they are responsible for that it is known as violence on responsibility second is violence on delegation then third is violence on non relief as a human being even though if you are not harming anybody if you are not preventing the person from being harmed from other people then you are also a partner of that violence so violence non violence means it does not mean that don't harm anybody even if you see somebody harming somebody else as a human being having a common species spirit you have to rush for the help if you are not doing you are getting the liability of non relief pattern of violence that is known as non relief pattern so if you are not relieving people from their problems number 1 if you are not guiding people properly if your delegations they are authoritatively they are responsible for that if you are having administrative responsibility you are said to be violent so violence is not only an individual quality you have to see that you are responsible dependents they are to be non violent and you have to prevent the violence whenever you have to see so this is known as composite study of ahimsa where it be mere restraint from uh, violence it does not be non violence in the vedic scope of violence whether you are doing whether you are seeing whether you are authorizing whether you are not relieving the person whether you are responsible that to do that impact if you are refraining from your duty you are responsible you get more punishment than the person who directly indulges in the ahimsa method so these are the various things and ahimsa has one more dimension the best tool in ahimsa is patience and forgiveness what is the beauty what is the ornament of ahimsa non violence means it should have two major dimensions two ornaments of ahimsa is one is patience you have to wait and second thing you must see that you must also know how to excuse things within the limit it is known as pattern zone what is the limitation for pattern whenever a person number 1 is ready to compensate if it is compensatable if the person is ready to compensate number 1 number 2 if he avoids repetition of the mistake if he has repetition for the mistake then the pattern zone can be executed so excuse can be given only in some areas to some mistakes because if you are not to be violent certainly you have to excuse the people if you have to excuse the people the people should be worthy of the excuse 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 should extinguish a person's committing of mistakes if you excuse a person forgiving a person should extinguish the flame of corruption or flame of sin inside him if you are excusing a person which fuels and manures the person's habitual mistake that type of excuse is very dangerous and that ahimsa is not properly administered so wherever you have to pattern people number 1 repentance number 2 avoidance of repetition of the mistake and compensation should be assured patience and forgiving they are the ornaments of the so called ahimsa apart from your ahimsa wherein by practice ahimsa you have other additional work also what teaching ahimsa number 2 training ahimsa you have to teach ahimsa already if the people are qualified and having a spirit of ahimsa inside teaching is enough if they need more messages you have to train the mere teaching will not work out so teach ahimsa train ahimsa demonstrate as an exemplary model so that seeing you they can be inspired and they can practice ahimsa prevent the himsa and protect people who are subjected to himsa and also say that you can captivate those people who are against ahimsa so that they can be directly or indirectly punished by mass protest self non violent measures and agitation judicial proceedings and democratic methodologies so prevent to protect to teach to train to demonstrate always to punish wherever it is possible and forgive wherever the pardon zone is executable these are all the various dimensions of ahimsa three types of uh, golden rules of ahimsa i want to say which are the quotations from shastras if your person is not harming other people because he is no having that is uh, incapable he 
if a person is totally incapable, not having the capable power to harm others, his ahimsa is useless. I am not harming anybody because I am not capable of harming others. And this type of ahimsa is not worthy at all. So, ahimsa is not worthy if a person is not harming others because of his incapability, because of not having any reason, because of not having opportunity. So, the Shastra say, if you have a reason to harm others, somebody is wounding you. If somebody is not wounding you, why you are doing ahimsa or why you are practicing ahimsa? If somebody is not connected with you, what is the thing that urges you to go for that ahimsa or ahimsa? So, there should be a reason to harm a person. There you should control yourself from harming the person. Number one, you should have the capability to harm the person. There you should control that you won't do that harm. Third thing, you must be having an opportunity to harm. So, most of the people are now practicing ahimsa because they don't have the capability, they don't have proper reason and they have not been given the opportunities. This type of ahimsa is not glorious. So, the Shastra says that you should have an opportunity, you should also have a reason and also a capability that you have to shower mercy and see that the person is made corrigible. This is not as real uh, And second thing, there are a lot of ethical issues in Ahimsa. Food cycle. Eating a lot of non-vegetarian things is very common in happy warriors and carnivorous animals. The food cycle that deals with violence. But that is a biological violence. Whatever we are doing is psychological violence. Biological violence is natural. Without that it cannot survive. But our violence is optional and it is psychological error. So we cannot compare this thing to that. So food cycle. Second thing is biocide. We are killing lot of living beings in various contexts. Number one, I want to say hunting. You are killing lot of wild animals. Number two, deforestation. You are cutting lot of trees. And third thing, insecticides. You are killing mosquitoes and other various other insects. Where to administer a hips are there. And fourth thing is very simple. Legal execution where people are executed in the terms of punishment by justice. That there is a coherent order of life. The coherent order of life is binded by uniformity of mutual affinity, relativity and productivity. And uh, killing these type of insects, like mosquitoes and disease causing insects, they don't come under the coherent cycle of uniformity. That's why killing is not a problem. And then legal execution for justice is also social amputation, wherein by unwanted and harmful portions are by surgery removed in our bodies. Social amputations in the case of incorrigible creatures for assuring peace and happiness for the uncountable myriads of innocent and poor people, we have to execute that. So, Ahimsa is not only refrainment from Himsa or violence, it is also proper administration of violence wherever it is required within the limited dosage for a limited number of people wherein by unless administered it will harm the mass society or mass code. So Ahimsa is not only apart from non-violence, it is also having a violent dimension where it is having a rational violence where it is having a systematized violence, where it is having an interpretable violence, it is what say. And the third point of the Vedas as per we have had from our scriptures is very interesting. Ahimsa, a person does not harm any other person, he is simply an important person. He should have some other additional qualities. First is Ahimsa, second is Satya. He must be having truth. If a person is not harming anybody, not doing anything, he is nowhere different from uh, a car sleeping inside a graveyard or a milestone. He should have a laudable quality also. So, number one is he must have non violence. Non violence should be based on truth, and truth will be based on penance that is known as tapasya. And these three qualities a person who is deep rooted in the qualities of truth and humanitarianism, he should be having non violence, as well as the person should have a deep mental thinking and mental sturdity a divine power, the power of God, the power of purity he should possess. A person not having power of purity or truth, merely having non-violence, he is not adorable, he is not uh, communicable, he is not laudable or profitable to the society. So it should be coupled with the qualities of truth as well as coupled with uh, the greatest spiritual or moral courage. Without their moral courage, that thing is useless. So this person practicing non-violence with truth and spiritual courage will have a divine intelligence and effulgence which we call in Sanskrit as stages. Such a person as having divine resplendence, such a person by seeing the people he can attract, seeing their enemies he can reduce them into ashes. Such a capability is known as stages. So the Shastras are our ancestors, they have not given an impotent, fit for nothing, irresponsible ahimsa and non-violence. Non-violence embedded with power, power of mass attraction, mass protest, power to command and demand the society, 
power to summon the ruling power and make them to prostrate before their feet and see that the truth is heard and justice is given audience. This type of greatest power has been given in our Shastras. And this type of uh, self-refinement, that is very great and that comes only by proper teaching, proper training and proper inheritance. Because whenever you see somebody crying, the mind will react in two methodologies. There are two manifestations of mind. If somebody cries, reciprocation, second thing is exasperation. If somebody is already crying, as a human being, as a part of this universe, you have to also cry and do the work. If you don't cry, then you are not a human being, part of the life at all. Such as if you have any part in your body which is subjected to bleeding, immediately you will feel the pain and cry. Likewise, in the social organism, wherever you see people suffering, you have to reciprocate. Reciprocation is a good opportunity. The other thing is exasperate. If somebody cries, if you cry, that is reciprocation. If somebody is already crying, you make them cry more, that is exasperation. That is a natural psychological blood in the society which should be treated. That should be treated only by exposure. People like students or police people or any person who is going to rule power, have power, have money, they should be first given social service projects. They have to see and feel, amidst the people, they have to see and feel what is hunger, what is poverty, what is insufficiency, what is malnutrition, what is disease and death, what is excruciating pain, what is separation and loneliness. They should be subjected to these grounds empathetically and they should be taught the rule how to experience these things so that they will have that reflection whenever see somebody suffering like that. So they should be given this type of uh, opportunity without which uh, there is no use for that. So this type of uh, opportunity without which uh, there is no use for that. So this type of non-violence which we have to practice is first they have to have a proper system of learning, education, exposure and experience in empathy. They say in Shastras, <coughs> they have to experience the fear, they have to experience the insecurity. The exposure, not only going to theatres, not only going to big places and malls and big uh, eco centres, they have to also visit some areas where people are suffering, where people are struggling and crying. They have to be exposed at place. And education should lead them to know about all of these things. So, education, exposure, and experience should be given to all of these people in non violence. And how to give all of these things? There are innumerable ways for mind taming. One is art and architecture. Persons who are exposed with art forms, they will be made smooth and soft. So there are five forms stored in our scriptures. One is art and architecture. Second is social service program. Third thing is religious refinement. Fourth thing is family inheritance. And fifth thing is education and maturity. So we can teach non-violence by education and maturity in schools, number one. And number two, directly subjecting them to social service projects. Each and every students after 10th standard, two months they have to suffer in Islam. Then only they can realize what is pain and what is violence and non-violence. So, family inheritance. The family people, they should be a good role model to the children. So, family inheritance, private subjection to social service projects, art and architecture, all of these various five major religious refinement, like baptism, like various sanskaras, they are meant for softening the person's mind. It creates emotional ability. For example, if you go for puja, they are hard in nature. Whereas painting, dance, music, architecture and other, other art forms, they are very casual, they are very attractive, they are very soothing. They are very comfortable to you so that any person doing a good painting about the position of the people with the thought, he should mix the paint with the pain of the people. He should mix the colors with the glamour and manner of the society. He should mix each and every concept of the world with the colors of uh, the gray and he has to present that model. Anybody moving with the society and its pain, certainly he will not harm anybody. He will see that nobody harms any other person. So this type of deep-rooted intravenous injection of the philosophy or the policy of non-violence can be practiced only by music, dance and painting. So these things they attract, they create emotional ability. What is emotional ability? A mother crying for her patient's son is known as emotion. If the son is a patient and mother cries, that is mere emotion. If the doctor is also having the same emotion, but is that is emotion ability. He converts his emotion. What is the requirement for the mother that the son must be cured? That is the same requirement for the doctor also. But he is not embracing the mother or the father and crying along with them. He comforts and consoles them and goes for ability by his surgical and pathological skills. That is known as emotional ability. 
Wherever we have emotions, sir, don't be broken. Convert them, solidify them into proper political force or impact force, whereby we can create lot of wonders in society. And somebody asked me, can the society is not so mature and civilized to adapt fully non-violence now? The society is in a very, very uncivilized status. Only few people are talking about administering or knowing about this Ahimsa Tattva. Most of the society are there in mutual Himsa. Why they are doing lot of this Himsa? Because of number one, exploitation. I told you in one seminar on labor science, I told you in seminar. In one seminar I told that, if a labor is working for 10 rupees, if you are giving 5 rupees, then that 5 rupees is the wages and the extra 5 rupees is the exploitation which is Himsa. So the exploitation of people, not paying them or paying them less, that is also uh, Himsa. So Himsa is not only physical torture, squeezing the work more than what they deserve and what they demand, that is also labor rights, which is a very wonderful thing for Himsa. And uh, labor justice is the purest form of Ahimsa. So non-violence is multifold and manifold. So exploitation, number one. And second thing is explosion. Whenever I'm angry, I have to show on people. That is explosion. That is also known as Himsa. And third thing is sadism. Wherever the persons are having psychological error of torturing others and getting their pressure, that is sadism. So exploitation, explosion, sadism and intolerance in the form of envy, hostility or disharmony. These things are the various roots of Ahimsa. So we have to start in all models. The hard model is known as teaching and training by spiritual methods and religious methods. And the soft methodology is by painting, music, dance and other forms. So we have to practice all of these forms and we have to get inspiration from living models as well as lived models and apply to the contemporary trends. Likewise, we have innumerable people. There are three people which we want to say and today they have been discussing about three, three people. A person who has met a challenge in India and a person who met the same challenge in the West and a person who has to meet both the challenges now in the growing society. The person who met the challenge by non-violence is Gandhi and the person who has met the same thing inspired by great people like Howard Thurman, Bayard Rustin and Mahatma Gandhi. These three inspirations they created a form of Junior Martin Luther King. He was there in the West and a person who has the responsibility to both the things, to miss both the things to produce an anti-terrorist campaign as well as to produce a democratic, fearless society now, such a person is Barack Obama, then we have taken these inspirations in various things. You know that Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, by means of mass support and mass attraction, a single person maintaining non-violence is more or less less than what we call imbecilism or impotentialism. A person who can command mass protest, agitation and mass support, such a person's non-violence will be obedient. It will be heard and it will be potentialized. So that is the greatness. So these leaders, they are having mass control or mass attraction or mass direction facilities. You know that Martin Luther King, each and everybody they had their own environment. Number one, political environment, social environment, the economical situation, the impact of the speeches of the society, the mindset of the society, innumerable things they vary. You cannot do a model for India to apply to Nigeria. For example, democracy of India cannot be immediately made suitable to Nepal or the Burma, the Myanmar, which is suffering from military rule now. Each and every should, everybody should make a pattern design which is very much suitable and applicable for the political trend, the moral trend, the mental trend, as well as the socio-economic factors of that country. This uh, Martin Luther King, he has told a very good statement which is very much a spiritual in nature, not religious in nature, spiritual nature, very wonderful statement. He told about Gandhi. Gandhi's statement are very much suitable to the inherent moral structure of the universe and it is in, as it is capable as the law of gravitation. See, moral structure of the universe. He told that there is a moral structure for the universe. That is a statement of Martin Luther King. What is moral structure of the universe? See, helping others or loving others is not a quality but it is a need of survival. It is a moral structure. Now what we are saying is loving others is a divine quality, helping others is a divine quality, you will get heaven. If you help others, whether you get heaven or not, you will live in hell, that is sure. The same world, not a separate hell. If you don't help others, if you exploit, the same world will be a hell for you or for your grandchildren. <laughs> so that's what he told, the whole universe is having a fabric of moral structure. Morality is not a divine quality. Morality or atheism is not a spiritual quality. Even the world has a moral fabric 
a moral structure. So, <coughs> Gandhiji's rules are very much attachable and affiliable to the moral fabric or network of the universe. And this rule is as inescapable to follow her as the rule of gravitation. You know magnetism, you know electricity, you know gravitation. We cannot escape from these rules. Likewise, the rule of helping others, the rule of social indiscrimination and justice is a moral fabric of the world. And this rule is as inescapable as electricity. So he considered this type of non-violence and helping others and social unity, uniformity and universal brotherhood to be a physical phenomena rather than an ethical and spiritual phenomena. He considered that if you touch fire, you will be burnt. If you touch electricity, you will get a shock. If there is mechanism, the mechanism of magnetism, it will attract and ripple. So Martin Luther King, apart from considering this as an ethical, spiritual quality, he considered it as a physical quality of the moral public of the world. That is a very great test. You know that he worked for racial indiscrimination, social justice, for labor rights, for civilian rights, for getting various other benefits of equality, equanimity and equinomity for the society he worked and he got the Nobel Prize in such a situation where uh, anybody cannot be getting that prize because lot of discrimination, suppression, domination and racial destination in the price makings were there existing at the time where there is, now we can just have backdoor entry, cross door entry, underground entry and everything for prices. At that time where that was not possible, wherever racial discrimination ruled at its peak, he got that which Gandhi even he was refused, that Nobel Prize. He got from a very exasperated environment, he has got that, that is a very great success. Now anybody getting a prize is just getting something from a bazaar or from a grocery shop. He should have some influence, that's all. Now, at that period of 1964 when he got out of great struggle, see, he got and then achieved. His mass approach and mass control, it created a very great renaissance in the society and after getting the Nobel Prize only, he made the US to pass the Civil Rights Bill. Act of 1964 and Voting Rights Act are built for 1965. After getting that money, he passed all of these things. And you know that he had the very great Albany campaign, the Birmingham campaign, the Albertan campaign, the Semler campaign, and he had the very great Washington March and Poor People's Campaign of 1968. He integrated the whole society to march against that type of future. So if anybody is handling non-violence, he should have three powers. One is very inspiring, soul stirring oration. Second thing, compassionate embracement of the society. Using these three tools, two tools, the third tool is he should have got a very massive, colossal mass support for the public. He should have a very great vocabulary, very great vocabulary means not linguistic vocabulary, psychological vocabulary, where he can feel the pulse and heartbeat of the people, where he can communicate with their hearts, not brains. So, this type of special oratory. Apart from this, he should have a compassionate behavior and gelling with the people inseparably. Third thing, using these two powers, he should command respect, courage and total submission and surrender from mass. This is the quality of leadership of non-violence. Without that, we are non-violence, I don't harm anybody, this is not totally useful at all. So that thing existed in these three people. These three people whom we are going to take now, they had all of these things. Now let us, in the concluding session, consider about the various differences in their periods and also some similarities. Number one, I told mass support. Gandhi also had mass support. Then uh, Martin Luther King also had that. Barack Obama, he has also come with mass support. So mass support is okay. <coughs> the second issue is, apart from mass support, technology we have to study. What was the technology there? At that time, technology's advancement was not there. Now we are having weapons of mass research. This issue was not there at the time of Gandhi. This issue was not so serious at the time of King. Now we are having two problems. One, weapons of mass destruction. Number two, availability of the technology, availability of the resources to non-state reactors and terrorism. The same technology, technology already the technology is double-ended knife and it is harmful. And this technology is very much available with the terrorist or non-state reactors more than the state reactors and politicians. That is the second problem. So now what we are facing is advancement of technology, not only in surveillance, not only in detection, not only in reconnaissance, not only in military intelligence, not only in protecting forces, in also destructive forces, we have advanced technologies and we have more accessibility for the destructors towards technology and money resources rather than political forces. That's the reason I already told you. 
A government should take care of agriculture, it should take care of the animal husbandry, health and hygiene, it should take care of education, employment and various things along with anti-terrorism. Whereas terrorists, they have to take care of only terrorism. They don't have any other job at all. So their resources are well managed, well utilized towards, they don't have any other job at all. So their resources are well managed, well utilized towards destructive purposes. Whereas these resources of the government ruling party, it is diversified for various applications. That is the problem between these two, that is technology. Third thing is very simple, security. What is the security? You know, you know that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And Gandhi was assassinated. Barack Obama certainly his life may be under perennial threat and possibility for attack. So, there are only three people. One is assassinated people, those who are attempted for assassination, those who have been in under plan or consideration by terrorists for assassination. There are only three leaders in the world, those who are considered for assassination, those who have been attempted for assassination, those who are already assassinated. So, all leaders will come under this category. So, security threat is also there. So, more security measures were there. You know that for King or Gandhi, lot of these uh, uh, bulletproof uh, vehicles or bulletproof coats, all of these things were not available, were not utilized at the time of their protection, this thing. Now, protection measures are also more and they are more prone to attack also. Each and every advancement of your technology, they are growing more than you. If you invent something else, they are simultaneously inventing something which can break your invention. So, this type of perennial combat between security and insecurity, that is also going in the society. Fourth thing is environment. At the time of Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi, the society was not so mature. They don't know much about democracy. They don't know much to use with media. Now we are having media support, NGO support. Eh? Like we are having MGO. Now we are studying about MGO. M means Mahatma Gandhi. Eh? But Martin Luther King, G means Gandhi, O means Obama. Eh? Like we are having MGO. We did not have proper NGOs or proper supportive mechanisms at that time also. Now in this environment, we have awareness. We have more awareness. That is a great problem. We are having more awareness. And excessive awareness. That awareness we have got from the damages of the history. We have seen two world wars. We have seen lot of internal conflicts, communal clashes, lot of terrorism and its impact. We have seen innumerable things. So now the people are little bit afraid. Now the people are little bit alert. Now the people are little bit alarmed. No, now the position he is supportive for democracy, supportive for uniformity. Now the people are opening slowly their eyes. So now the time, the environment is more. But the problem in the present society is very simple. We are not having the willpower of our external ancestors. We don't have that willpower. If today somebody is going to bomb Nagasaki or Hiroshima, the same power, now the construction technology is more. Financial resources of Japan is more. All opportunities are more in Japan. But with the same vigor and willpower, can they reconstruct those two cities provided God forbid if those cities are destroyed? If you ask the question, similarly we can say no. Because technology has improved, science has advanced, and the financial or the economic resources have been uplifted. But the moral courage and willpower of the common people now, that is only one tenth. Into ten, technology has developed. But divided by ten, the willpower has been reduced. That is the present society. So in this society, the living Barack Obama, he has to do his circus in which he is going to do. Huh? He has created a project known as circus, wherein by China, India, Russia, United States and Central Asia along with Saudi Arabia, CAR, CUS, they are going to join for an anti-terrorism federation front. He has to execute his circus only in this area where technology is more, fear is more for entering into violence. but. To tackle these things, moral courage and willpower is very, very less. And spiritual people, academicians, NGOs and saints, they have to come for the survival of the society, rescue of the society from these problems. Now everybody is subjected to accusation. Any problem or anything good you do, they will be subjected to accusations, any complaints or criticism. There are a lot of criticism about Martin Luther King also. Lindsay Johnson, he worked with Martin Luther King, he has written a commentary book. And Ralph Albernak, he has written a book, and David Garrow, he is a biographer of Martin Luther King. So, there will be somebody in this universe to glorify scoundrels, and there will be simultaneously persons available to criticize and accuse people who are doing good for the society. So, any person doing in this non violent campaign, they should have number one, courage and self determination. Number two, power to speak their heart and kindle the heart of the others and to command their respect and love. Number two, 
Number three, integral support of the mass which is created must be systematized by an institution, an institution for non-violence. Number four, I have already told, dance and non-violence, music and non-violence, painting and non-violence, education and non-violence, family inheritance, domestic training and non-violence. So they have to create a lot of institutions like violence. Family inheritance, domestic training and non-violence. So they have to create a lot of institutions like that. Number five, they have to pray for development of non-violence just not as a divine quality but as a dynamic divine principle which can govern the world. Non-violence is not to see that the people are happy, comfortable and peaceful. Without non-violence, the society cannot spring at all. Non-violence is not a sleeping quality. Non-violence does not make you to sleep. It makes you to be awakened. It makes you to be a spiritual, a scriptural, productive dynamite to bombard the society with all essential pressures and richness of the world. Let us bring back peace to the world, which was once again the heartbeat of the God, heartbeat of the universe, and heartbeat of each and every individual, each and every species of the world. Narayana, Narayana.